Archaic Records. Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Archaic Records here with you again. My name is Jamie, coming at you from Nashville, Tennessee. And today we're going to go back to 1977 and take a look at one of the most important and influential albums in the history of pop music. The 1977 self-titled debut album by American Electro Punk's uh, Suicide. Uh, now this band was formed in 1970 in New York City. Uh, the two deranged lunatics behind this project are instrumentalist Martin Rev, who was born on December 18, 1947 in Brooklyn, New York, uh, and vocalist Alan Vega, who was born on June 23, 1938, in New York City. Uh, the band's name came from the title of an issue of a ghostwriter comic book, which was called Satan Suicide. Uh, according to Alan Vega, uh, the band was referring to the suicide of society, uh, especially American society. Uh, New York City was collapsing, uh, the Vietnam War was going on, and the name suicide really said it all to us, uh, is what Alan Vega said about the band's name. Now, in early, in, by the early 1970s, this band had begun to build uh, itself a reputation within the New York City music underground uh, with its confrontational and some right, some sometimes outright volatile uh, live performances. Now, this was a trait that the band would uh, continue on throughout the duration of their career. Uh, the band released its first single, Rocket USA, in 1976. And they released their first album in 1977. Now, for me, my personal relationship with this band began probably back in the mid uh, to late 1990s. I was still relatively new into this style of music. I had just kind of waded maybe waist deep into the shallow end. Uh, and I remember flipping through. It was an issue of Q or... Spin or perhaps maybe Rolling Stone, but it was one of those commemorative type issues that they used to put out. You know, it was like the 100 most essential records in the history of punk rock uh, or something like that. Uh, and being that I was still somewhat a new fan to this style of music, I was always looking uh, for tips uh, for new bands to check out, new artists to listen to. Uh, and as I was thumbing through that issue, I stumbled upon a picture of uh, the band Suicide's first record, <clears throat> alongside you know, a little write-up of the record. Uh, and I remember seeing this and just being completely uh, fixated by it. Of course, you know, the name Suicide, I automatically thought, I was like, oh, man, that's pretty cool right there. Uh, and, of course, uh, next to it, they had a picture of the album art, which I, at the time, I thought was pretty snug. Uh, anyway, this completely piqued my interest. Uh, and at my next possible convenience i ran down to my local record store uh, and i found a copy of this record i was very excited to get this thing home and listen to it uh, so as soon as i got it home i threw it on the old stereo and i have to tell you that i immediately hated it i could not stand this record the first time i heard it it was totally not what i was expecting I mean, I don't really know what I was expecting. I guess I was probably expecting it, you know, just to sound like the Ramones. I mean, what's the problem? Why can't everything just sound like Generation X? Damn it! Uh, anyway, I listened to it a couple more times after that. Uh, and I remember, uh, you know, as I was listening to it just a couple times right when I first got it, I was like... <sighs> you know, like really grasping at straws trying to figure out uh, what was so great about this record. And, of course, I, I remember ended up thinking to myself, yeah, of course some critic likes it. Critics like everything that isn't good, just because it makes them feel uh, superior to their fellow man. Uh, so after maybe two, three, I mean, four would probably be a stretch, uh, listens to this record, I threw it on the shelf where it lived peacefully, for several years. Now, I, of course, I kept it because I'm a pack rat, but uh, it lived very peacefully, quietly, collecting dust uh, on my CD shelf, and every once in a while, I would dig it back out, 
and I would try to give it another listen, and it was to the same result. I just didn't get it. I didn't understand uh, what was so great about it. You know, I admittedly, I am not the sharpest bulb in the shed, <laughs> uh, but it was just a record that for so long, you know, I couldn't understand uh, what people saw in it. Of course, like I said, I held on to the CD uh, because I pretty much hold on to every CD, but I remember it was a CD too. It was funny. This was a CD... Uh, that if you had it in your collection, you know, people came over uh, to look at your music collection. I mean, I don't know if you remember those days when you go over to somebody's house and just, you know, look at their music collection, like... I mean, that was an activity back in those days. That was a social activity as far as I've, I was concerned. Still is. Uh, really, but it's funny. <laughs> when people saw that you had this record... Uh, in your CD or vinyl collection, I don't have this record on vinyl. Unfortunately, I do have this uh, CD, but it was a it was a record that would some for some reason it would always impress people. Like, oh man, yeah, you got that first Suicide record, uh, and of course, uh, I, you know, I would be like, yeah, of course I do. I mean, who do you think you're talking to here? I ain't no amateur. You know, but in my head, I was just like. <laughs> So I think it was probably, probably like around, maybe like 2005 or 2006. It was probably a solid 10 years after I bought the record for the first time. I remember I was, I was talking to somebody. I, I think I kind of remember it was around 2005 because I move around a lot, or I have moved around a lot. And I sort of remember periods of my life based on where I was in my moves at that point in time. And I remember... I moved to Seattle in 1999, and then I left Seattle in the very end of 2002, and I moved to Chicago, where I lived in Chicago for about two and a half years. I remember I moved back to, and then I moved back to Seattle, and I remember I moved back to Seattle at the end of 2004, because I remember I landed back in Seattle on Election Day 2004. <laughs> it seems like a long time ago. It seems like much more innocent times back then. I remember thinking, uh, even though Bush had just gotten reelected, I remember thinking, well, we can't really, we could never do any worse than George Bush, could we? And we found a way to uh, continually get worse than George Bush. But I, I do remember that was probably around 2000, 2005 or 2006, because I remember I was back in Seattle from my trip to Chicago, and I was talking to somebody about this record and uh, they were somebody whose musical opinion I, tr I respected. He and I had a lot of uh, sort of mutual interest when it came to music. And he was talking about this record. Uh, and I remember he was just very passionate about it. He was convinced that this was one of the greatest and most important records of all time. And I remember trying to explain to him, I was like, dude, I don't get it. I don't understand that record. I've owned it for probably eight or nine, maybe ten years. I've probably listened to it seven times i can't even hardly get through the whole thing uh, and he basically gave me a homework assignment he's like no man go back and like really listen to it and give it like a real open-minded chance like i said i think when i first bought this record uh, i was still relatively new into the kind of punk rock world i think i expected it to sound like or maybe i wanted it to sound like the ramones or generation x or the sex pistols or the jam uh, the clash and obviously this record is completely different it's its own entity uh, so I remember, of course, I still owned it on CD, so I, I went home that evening, and I went home and I listened to it, and for the first time, my experience, the record very slowly began to sort of grow on me. I remember I went home and I listened to it uh, that night, and I didn't love it immediately that night, but I went home, I listened to it, and I was like, all right, okay, I'm kind of beginning to understand it, and... Over the course of the next maybe month or so, I really immersed myself in this record. I listened to it just over and over and over again to the to where I got to the point to where I became a fan of it. And then I almost became just obsessed with this record. And then I became the guy who was preaching its gospel to anybody that would listen. I remember at the time I had a job where, you know, we could the employees could bring CDs into the place I worked. Uh, and, you know, you'd share the CD player throughout the day. 
everybody got a couple of turns throughout the course of like an eight hour shift. And I remember I used to bring this CD into work with me. Once I finally got to where I became a big fan of it, I started to bring this CD into work because despite the fact that it's relatively abrasive sounding, especially the first couple of times you hear it, I loved it. I was really excited about it at that point in time. I didn't necessarily do it to torture my coworkers, uh, but I was told by my manager that uh, it might be a wise idea if you just kind of left this CD at home. Uh, people tend to complain about it. Uh, I do remember there was a girl I worked with at that job, and her and I were pretty good friends. We had, again, I say this about a lot of people, but we had relatively similar tastes in music. And I remember one time uh, this CD was playing at work, and she's... Uh, she said to me, this CD literally makes me want to commit suicide, just so you know. So if you could do me a favor uh, and never bring the CD back again, I would really appreciate it. Uh, but that was sort of the uh, first time when I really, you know, kind of like began to develop an appreciation for this uh, record. I went back and I, I just listened to this thing nonstop for probably a couple of years and it's a record I, at this point in time, I don't listen to uh, quite as much as I used to. Uh, but it is a record that I love. I do believe that this is uh, one of the most important and influential records uh, really in the history of pop music. I mean, there was nothing that sounded like this record uh, before it came out. Very little that sounds like this record, uh, you know, since it's come out. Uh, to me, this record, I mean, this record still sounds like futuristic uh, you know this record has always sounded like it's 20 years uh, it's from 20 years in the future even today you put this record on uh, this record still sounds uh, like it's from 20 years uh, in the future it's like apocalyptic it's nerve-wracking uh, it's uncomfortable uh, it's beautifully chaotic uh, again i think that this is one of uh, the best Records, arguably one of the greatest records ever made. That being said, this is not a record for everybody. I do remember uh, when I used to spread the gospel of this record a lot. A lot of people uh, told me they couldn't even get through uh, the first half of it without turning it off because it is grating. It can be abrasive. It is dark. Uh, this is a record that I, I've kind of learned in to kind of curtail who I recommend this record to. In fact, I'm pretty sure my wife hates this record. Uh, when I'm up here in my record room listening to it, I don't think that she's generally a very big fan of those days. Uh, anyway, let's get into this record uh, just a little bit. This record was released on December 28th, 1977. Uh, this band, or this record, I should say, just celebrated its 46th birthday. Uh, like I said, this record still sounds... It doesn't even sound fresh and new. I mean, this thing sounds like futuristic. Uh, so it trips me out that this record is 46 years old. I love the production on this record. Uh, this record uh, it was produced by Craig Leon and Marty Tao. I love the artwork on the front. The name with the word suicide with the font. And then the bloody, it looks like somebody's taken a razor blade and just slashed their wrists apart. I love the artwork on this record. Uh, the first song on this record is a song called Ghost Rider. Uh, this song kind of drops right in on top of you with these sort of pulsating electronics, uh, of course, provided by Martin Rev. Uh, the first time you hear this record, you instantly recognize that you've never heard anything like this before. Uh, suddenly, uh, from out of nowhere, Alan Vega appears uh, with his neurotic, angst-ridden uh, vocals. I think Alan Vega has one of the most unique voices and vocal deliveries uh, really in the history of pop music. I mean, when you hear it, you really can't confuse him uh, with anybody else. I love this first song. Its song sounds like a panic attack. I think it's uh, chaotic. Uh, it's unnerving. Uh, but at the same time, it's it's beautiful. Of course, this song... Uh, had some new life breathed into it back in the 1990s when this song uh, was covered by the Rollins Band uh, for the Crow soundtrack. Now, I love the Rollins Band. I am a huge fan of Hank. 
Apparently, Henry Rollins is my neighbor uh, down here in Nashville. Uh, supposedly, he lives very close to my neighborhood down here somewhere. My wife is always on these sort of, uh, you know, what is it, Reddit? Is that what it's called? The sort of the neighborhood gossip web pages uh, where people <laughs> passive aggressively bitch each other out and talk about who they've seen and where they've seen them. Well, there's a GameStop. Literally, like, right around the corner from our house. And supposedly, Henry Owens is always at that GameStop. There's also a sandwich shop over there uh, where people see him uh, quite frequently. So apparently, Henry Owens is my neighbor. I'm a huge fan of him. Uh, my wife always asks me, what would you do if you saw Henry Owens while we were out? Uh, my, I would like to think if I did, I would, you know, I'd be cool, man. Cool. What's up, Hank, buddy? What's going on, bro? But I know myself well enough to know that what I would probably do is I would probably drop, drop a log in my trunks and uh, probably completely embarrass myself. It's probably just better if I don't see Henry out there, if he does, in fact, live somewhere in this neighborhood close by. Uh, anyway, the Rollins Band did a cover of the song uh, Ghost Rider on the... Crow soundtrack, and like I said, I love Henry Rollins, I love the Rollins band, I love Black Flag. Uh, that being said, I don't really love their cover of the song Ghost Rider on the Crow soundtrack. I mean, how good is the Crow soundtrack still after all these years? I mean, really. Uh, but to me, Suicide is just a, it's a band that's like almost impossible to cover. Uh, you know, especially if you have a band... It sounds like Rollins Band. It just doesn't really translate. Nothing against you, Hank. I love you. Maybe I'll see you at the game. I'm not a gamer. So I probably won't see him at the GameStop. I can't. Is it? I don't, it's weird to think of Henry Rollins hanging out at GameStop being a gamer. I don't know why. Uh, it weirds me out. But I do love the song Ghost Rider. Uh, like I said, the song is just like kind of a panic attack uh, set to music. I love it. Uh, the next song after that is a song called Rocket USA. Uh, to me, this song has kind of a similar sound to Ghost Rider, although it's a slowed-down version of it. Uh, ironic, based on the subject matter of the lyrics. Uh, after a few seconds of the sort of electronic intro, uh, there's this symbol that just starts, like, bashing you right in the frontal lobe throughout uh, the rest of the duration of the song. It actually reminds me, I had this older cousin uh, when I was growing up. Well, I still have this older cousin i don't know where he is at this point in time and i'm not particularly interested but this song reminds me of <laughs> the symbol in this song i should say it reminds me of i had this cousin growing up who was older than me now i was the oldest of my siblings uh, and my mom and her sister this aunt were relatively close uh, but this cousin was a couple years older than me and i kind of looked up to him when i was a kid he was kind of like my older brother figure we were relatively close uh, but one thing he used to do was he used to pin me down on the ground and he'd put his forearm into my, uh, under my uh, throat here and he would take his finger and he would just tap it right here in my, right in the middle of my forehead for what seemed like ever. Uh, and that's what the, <laughs> that's what this song, like the beat of this song reminds me of. It's like, dun, 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 just right in the middle of your forehead. Uh, every time I hear the song, I think of that particular cousin uh, torturing me by tapping me right in the middle of my forehead i love the song uh, rocket usa of course as i mentioned before that was the band's first single which came out in 1976 uh, after that the next song is a song called sheree uh, now this is like a slow steamy uh, you know sexy song you know about somebody who is getting ready to, uh, you know, go out and get just like a hot piece of rug. Uh, you know, unlike the first two songs on this record, which are sort of grating and abrasive and like uncomfortable, uh, this song is actually really beautiful. It's, uh, it's almost like hypnotic. Uh, the vocals and the lyrics are quite sweet. Like I said, this is this is a song about somebody who's getting ready to go out and, you know, get a little bit of rug. Uh, nothing wrong with that. Uh, the next song after that, uh, this song is called uh, Johnny. Uh, I always 
think of the lyrics of this song. I picture somebody, uh, a guy who's out walking the streets of New York City, you know, dressed right, feeling tight, you know, looking for a little bit of rug. Uh, you know, musically, this song kind of has the same swagger uh, as the guy who is depicted in the lyrics. You know, you're just kind of like, you know, you're feeling good. Strutting through New York City, you know, you're looking good, you're feeling tough. Looking for a little bit of that fresh pelt. Maybe even a little stinky pelt. I mean, really, who cares? You know, looking like this, you can't really be that selective. Uh, but I love this song. It's got like a swagger to it. Uh, the song is about a guy who's just like oozing confidence for some reason. Uh, and he just knows that he's going to go out there. And he's going to get a little bit of rug tonight. He's dressed right. He's feeling ready. Uh, the next song after that is a song uh, called Girl. Uh, this song is another song about cleaning carpets. Uh, this song is hypersexual. It's got like a very sultry uh, vocal delivery uh, laid down uh, by Alan Vega. Kind of in front of this like beautifully psychedelic backdrop uh, instrument instrumentally this is probably one of my favorite songs on the record uh, it kind of to me it kind of sounds like if you know strawberry alarm clock and craft work uh, were somehow uh, mated together i think this is kind of you know what the what those two bands together might sound like again this is another very sexual song Alan Vega trying to go out and get himself a little bit of carpet. Uh, the next song after that is uh, 10 and a half minutes. Probably 10 and a half of the most disturbing minutes of your entire life. Uh, this is a song called Frankie Teardrop. Uh, this is the story of a man that is living on the fringes of society, uh, unable to make ends meet. And finally, one day, either out of desperation or basically because something snaps inside of him, uh, he decides that he is going to take out his entire family. Uh, Alan Vega describes uh, one point of the song where uh, he picks up a gun and he points it at his six-month-old baby. And then after a few sort of unnerving moments of vocal silence, Alan Vega just lets rip with this just heinous scream. Uh, not long after that, the character sees the wife out of his out of the corner of his eye. He turns, uh, points the gun at her, and kills his wife. Again, after a few more sort of you know uneasy seconds of vocal silence, Alan Vega lets loose with this just gut churning scream i mean this is a scream that could make your toenails fall out uh, after that the character uh, trying to wrap his mind around around what he's done you know his body and mind are racing around uh, suddenly he stops dead in his tracks points the gun at his own head uh, and kills himself uh, now this song goes on for another <laughs> Like excruciating, you know, five minutes of just sadistic madness. Uh, this song, to me, actually sounds like a crime scene. Uh, this song sounds like a horrific nightmare. Uh, this is probably the band's most famous or at least infamous song. Uh, you mention this band, anybody who knows who they are, and almost inevitably the first two words that come out of their mouth are, Frankie Teardrop! Uh, I remember the girl who... I worked with in Seattle. I'm not laughing at her, but the girl who told me that this band literally made her want to commit suicide. I remember one day before she expressed that to me, I remember one day I brought this CD into work uh, and as the song Frankie Teardrop was playing, she literally started crying. And I remember thinking to myself, I, I bet Alan Vega and Martin Rev would just be fine with that, honestly. Uh, it is literally... 10 of the most uncomfortable minutes that I can imagine in the history of music. Uh, it, is, uh, it is just uncomfortable. Uh, 
like I said, this song sounds like a horrific, uh, you know, murder suicide. This is a song when it, you know, I really have to, I still at this point in time have to be really in the mood for this song. Uh, I was talking to somebody about uh, this band recently, and of course they mentioned the song Frankie Teardrop. And he said that he had this song on his, on some, on, or had this record on, you know, a playlist or one of his devices. And he's like, yeah, I, he's like, I couldn't even put the song Frankie Teardrop on it. He's like, I like the rest of the album. But the song Frankie Teardrop is just too much for me. He's like, I can't handle it. Driving to work in the morning, that song, come, song comes on. It's going to ruin my whole day. Uh, I love that song, but like I said, I have to be in the mood for it. If I'm not in the mood for that song, even if I put this record on to listen to the rest of it, if, if I'm not in the mood for Frankie Teardrop, I will skip it. Uh, the last song on this record uh, is a song called Che. Now, this song is kind of quiet and understated. There's still something unsettling about it. Uh, every time I listen to this record all the way through, the song is kind of unsettling, but I can never figure out if it's just the hangover from the last 10 minutes listening to Frankie Teardrop, or if there's something genuinely uh, unsettling going on here. Uh, musically, this song kind of sounds like a haunted mansion. It's sort of spooky, a little bit gothy. I really love it. I think it's a great way to close out the record. Of course, uh, this record only has seven songs on it. Frankie Teardrop, of course, being almost 11 minutes long. Uh, on this particular uh, CD, uh, this is the remastered version. This is the two-disc uh, remastered version. Uh, there is There are three bonus tracks on the album CD. Uh, the first one is a remix version of the song Cherie. Uh, so if you've made it all the way through the first song, or the first, the original version of Cherie, and you're still pumping. You can uh, go right into the remix if you'd like. Uh, it also has a song called I Remember. I like this song. Uh, this is sort of a trancy little trip down memory lane. Uh, I feel like this song is looking back kind of at simpler times. Uh, you know, based on the timing of this record, I sort of picture... Uh, Alan Vega writing this record about life in America, uh, sort of pre-Vietnam. Uh, musically, I like the uh, I like the track too. It's sort of simple. Uh, it's it's understated. I do enjoy it. Uh, and the last song off of the remastered version, at least, is a song called "Keep Your Dreams." I love this song. This is actually one of my favorite songs on the record. It's very new wavy. Uh, it's really. Um, you know, this song feels like very optimistic, very hopeful, almost whimsical, if you will. It urges its listeners uh, to pursue that in life, which provides them with happiness uh, or a sense of fulfillment. And instrumentally, this song is like uplifting. It's light. Uh, it's feathery, if you don't mind me saying. Uh, and on this remastered CD version, too, um, it has two discs. The second disc has... A live at CBGB's 1977 uh, recording, which has uh, the tracks Mr. Ray, which is an awesome song. I love that song. Uh, Las Vegas Man, 96 Tears, a live version of Keep Your Dreams, a live version of I Remember, uh, the song Harlem. This particular remastered uh, version also uh, contains the notorious... Live recording at 23 minutes over Brussels. Uh, this was that was recorded in Brussels, Belgium, on June 16th, 1978, as the band were on the road supporting uh, Elvis Costello and the Clash. Uh, the band was poorly received by a crowd that was, you know, judging by the recording, they were really only interested in hearing Elvis Costello uh, after a couple, just a couple of songs. The set just devolves basically into chaos now if you read reviews of the 23 minutes over brussels recording some people say it you know goes into you know full-on riot i think that's being a little bit hyper dramatic there is a part in the recording they're playing the song frankie teardrop live and somebody rushes the stage and snags uh, alan vega's uh, microphone away from him by the time he gets it back alan vega then 
sort of goes on this <clears throat> tirade, you know, explicit uh, tirade against the crowd, uh, profanity laden, if you will. Uh, and after about 22 minutes, the band walks off stage, which is where they earn their only applause of the night. Uh, so check out 23 Minutes Over Brussels if you haven't, uh, if you haven't heard that either. It's sort of a, I think it's a kind of an over-dramatized you know, piece of folklore surrounding the band. It wasn't really a riot. It was just basically a show where the opening band wasn't particularly of interest to the crowd. And I think if you are somebody who was unfamiliar with Suicide, uh, their sound, their attitude, and especially back in those days, the nature of their live performances, uh, that could easily turn bad. And I think the 23 minutes over Brussels uh, was just one of those moments where, you know, people just didn't want to, didn't want to see the shit, and Alan Vega <laughs> was not going to, uh, you know, he was not going to uh, shy away. It's interesting to think about, one thing that's interesting to think about uh, with this record, especially this record, like I said, it just turned 46 years old, uh, December 28th. Uh, Alan Vega, so this record came out at the very end of 1977, December 20th, 1977. Alan Vega turned 40. That next summer. So it's hard to imagine. It's one thing I always find interesting about this record is that Alan Vega was basically 40 years old when this record come out, came out. Uh, he was out there hobnobbing and touring and running around with kids that were literally half of his age uh, at the time. I can only imagine what some of those younger uh, punk bands thought of Alan Vega before they actually saw Suicide perform or heard his music. They're probably like, who the hell is this grandpa? And then he takes the stage and he scares everybody half to death. Uh, so I always think it's interesting that Alan Vega was basically 40 years old uh, by the time this first record came out. It kind of blows me away. Uh, in 1980, Suicide released their second album, which I really like as well. Uh, it's definitely not as good as the first record by any stretch of the imagination, but it has a lot of really good stuff on it. Uh, it's got a, kind of a different sound, especially on the electronics and especially on the production. You know, one of the things I love so much about this record is I love the nasty, raw, uh, I don't want to say amateurish, but very, uh, you know, understated production. I thought the second Suicide record, which I like, I do like, I think it's just a little bit overproduced and the electronics on it are sound, sound a lot cleaner and sound a lot different. But I really do like the second Suicide record as well if you haven't checked out the second Suicide record. You know, be sure to uh, do that at some point in time. Uh, over the years, the band released three more studio albums. Uh, to me, they were okay. I think all of those records, uh, you know, they all have their moments. But, you know, all in all, after the first two records, uh, this is a band that kind of lost me now. Of course, both Martin Rev and Alan Vega both put out just you know, tons of solo music over the years. And some of that stuff I thought was really good, especially I like a lot of the, I do like a lot of the, the Alan Vega solo stuff. Uh, some of the Martin Rev solo stuff is okay. I, I definitely kind of lean more towards uh, the Alan Vega side when it comes to the, you know, the solo records. Uh, and on July 6th, 2018, uh, sadly, at the age of 78, Alan Vega passed away. His, uh, his uh, death was publicly announced, at least, by Henry Rollins. I believe that's what I read uh, on Henry Rollins' radio show at the time. Uh, Alan Vega was 19, he was 78 years old. He died in New York City. And to me, he left behind, just musically speaking, he left behind the legacy uh, of two just incredibly important uh, suicide records, especially the first one. Uh, but apart from that, he was a painter, he was a sculptor, he was a writer, he was a visual artist, and one heck of a scary guy, if you ever got a chance to see him live, apparently. Now, unfortunately, I never got a chance to see uh, Suicide Live. Uh, even in the later years, I know they were active uh, kind of, you know, intermittently throughout the years. Uh, it was a band I probably had an opportunity to see live. I never had that, never took the opportunity if I had it. But uh, Alan Vega did pass away uh, in 2016 at the age of 78. Uh, so if you haven't gone back and listened to this suicide record at all, or if you haven't in a while, uh, 
I, I highly recommend that you do. Anyway, man, thank you so much for checking out this video. Uh, this is Archaic Records. My name is Jamie, coming at you from Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, be sure to go out and support your local record store. Uh, check back every week, or most weeks at least, for Morrissey Monday, my weekly celebration of all things Morrissey and the Smiths, uh, as well as other record content throughout the week. And until next time, my friends... I'll talk to you then.